Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tracks Through Time. I'm your host, Brightways Deputy Editor, Brielle Jekyll, and I'm here to tell you some of the most interesting stories throughout history in transportation and freight. And like always, Mary O'Connell is here with us today, but today's going to be a little different because even though I just said I have interesting stories throughout history in transportation and freight, today it will be Mary. Yes, today we are switching places, and I could not be more excited. Um, This is, uh, turns out, if you just badger Brielle long enough, she'll let you tell a story. Uh, Oh, I thought of it as my Christmas gift from you. It really is, honestly, and it is very fitting. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's a T-Rex. I'm I'm dressed appropriately for the occasion. So Dressed in black, so... I don't know them. Um, but this week, it's a, we're covering something that is not traditionally something that you think of when you think of the supply chain. You know, you're going to, you might think of, um, you know, boats and trains and everything like that. Today, we're talking about trees. We're talking about trees. I, if we talk about this, anytime we talk about this tree, I think about the, this part of it. Yes. Because it's such a big, literally big. Yes. And it is the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And for anyone who does not know, this thing is massive. And it stands in the middle of Manhattan. And uh, I don't know, uh, for those who, you know, maybe aren't familiar with the Big Apple, uh, it's not really known for being a forest. So today we're going to dive into kind of um, the supply chain aspect, sourcing the tree, getting the tree to where it is, and also the history of the tree itself, because it is um, appropriate. It's appropriate. It was just lit yesterday. So um, it's what a better time than now. So, uh, Brielle, are you ready to understand or to go down a journey of how the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree uh, gets to where it needs to be every year? I'm so excited because I love the tree. I even went to go to the lighting one year. Don't don't ever do that. <laughs> I like most normal people uh, have gone to the tree. I think like a week or two after it's lit, where it's still busy, but it's less uh, insane. I should say. Oh, should we do show and tell now, or do you want? Oh wait no, till show and tell at the end. I want to. I want to do the mark. Okay, we got to okay. get the history behind it before we cool, cool. do the show and tell. All right. So. Uh, the uh, fun fact, uh, the bria- uh, the tree does not stay year round. It doesn't. It comes down after Christmas and uh, they don't plant a new one. So uh, if you're uh, actually if you're ever in New York City outside of Christmas time, you can go to Rockefeller Center and there's this giant gold plate on the ground that says like where the Christmas tree will stand when it's there uh, at Christmas time, which is really cool to see- be there um, when it's when it's up and then also when it's not. But before we get too far into how the tree gets down through the streets of Manhattan, we're going to take a tour as to how this tradition got started. The first Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center was erected in 1931 during the Depression era construction of Rockefeller Center. How appropriate. It's when Italian American workers decorated a smaller 20 foot tree with strings of cranberries and garland and paper and even a few tin cans because why not? Uh, they did it on Christmas Eve. Now, to me, a 20 foot tree is still a large tree as I could not even put that inside my house. So, all right, so we've got the first tree, 1931. Fast forward two years, and there was the first official tree of Rockefeller Center. And it was 50 feet tall, and it was considered a holiday beacon for New Yorkers and visitors. This tree was, quote, from the beginning, a gathering place and reflection of what was happening in the world around it. So uh, every year, the tree kind of mimicked things that were happening um, both here in the States and then worldwide. So it's always been kind of cool. We saw that especially during World War II when there was um, simple patriotic decorations, including red, white, and blue, and then unlit globes and painted wooden stars. Uh, In 1942, instead of one large tree, there were three modest trees, and each one was decorated in the flag's color of red, white, and blue. Um, 
And then actually the the dark days came and uh, from 1944 to 1945, the tree went unlit due to back out, blackout regulations uh, to support the war effort. Mm-hmm. Always. I mean, and it's just like with the parade. <laughs> it was anything to support the war, man. I mean, it truly, It. I don't think I could even fathom what that day-to-day life would have looked like. For, like everything just went to the front and everything like that. And I know that that's incredibly privileged to say something like that, but I just, I could not imagine living through the day-to-day. I know just all like just the way it changed life over here even when the the war was so overseas you know yeah um so then we are fast forwarding to the end of world war ii um well a couple years after it uh the 1950s workers actually that's when the scaffolding came in um probably much to osha's regulations um i don't actually know if that was before osha or i would imagine that osha was around about then maybe um but yeah so safety for people decorating um let me, the wood room. It, osha was not oh okay so the scaffolding 1971 1971 okay um so that's thank you for looking that up um so the um because the trees kept getting larger and larger every year they had to get a little more creative um with how they were going to decorate it and that's how the scaffolding came in um, and so before the decade of the 1950s was over, there was over 20 people yeah. decorating this tree, the Rockefeller Center tree, and it took over nine days. Nine days? Nine yeah. days. I can see that. I mean, for me, to de- let's see, this year I decorated a seven foot tree. And after we figured out the lights, because that took a hot minute because we bought this. I bought this thing that was supposed to make it easier to decorate your tree with lights, but it definitely made it more complicated. So after that, it oh, no. took about like an hour or two. So I would imagine like seven times however many to get to 50 feet would be. Well, it's a completely different operation because instead of, um, you know, uh, just hanging little lights you're like cranes and scaffolding and all that stuff you're not really sitting there with like your significant other in a corner saying like i'm gonna pass you through the lights and then you just right around um i don't think you could get your arms fully around the tree but anyway so moving forward so 1951 was the very first time that nbc televised the tree lighting it was a special on the kate smith hour and then in 1969, uh, Valerie Claire Bout, her towering wire, those so those angels that you see in Rockefeller Center, those gold, beautiful angels, that was her art that was added to the gardens in front of the tree near Fifth Avenue. And so she created 12, those 12 sculptures with 75 points of metal wire each. So that I always kind of wondered where those came from, but those are those are still there. It's kind of cool. So we're fast forwarding again. The we're fast forwarding again to 1971. There was that year that it was a 65 foot tall tree from East Montpelier, Vermont, and it was the first to be mulched and recycled. It was turned into 30 tree bushel bags of mulch, and it was used for the nature trails in Upper Manhattan. So typically, the um, the and then also in 1988 the tree was actually flown in from Richfield, Ohio, instead of driven in from like upstate New York or somewhere in the New England area. Flown. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll get to the flight in a little bit. Um, (laughs) So then our tallest tree that we've ever had on record was 1999. And that was from Killingworth, Connecticut. And it was 100 feet tall, um, which I don't even know how to fathom how tall that is. It's like, I'm trying to imagine, like, looking outside my house, what a 100-foot tree outside my house would look like. Yeah. So, um, you know, the tree is more than just a tree. It's, it's There's more eco-friendly things with it, which, you know, makes my sustainable ha- heart so happy. Um, right. In 2007, the tree went green, which is funny because it's a green tree. It went green. Okay. Well, it uses... Um, <laughs> no. Get out of here, Dad. Uh, but it uses LED lights now. And so the LED lights use 1,200 fewer kilowatt hours of electricity per day 
which is enough to power a 2,000 square foot home for a month. So that's how much That's why my husband is always talking about going with LEDs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It uses so much less energy. And, you know, we just, we we love a, a sustainable fan. We love a sustainable move. But also, it's not, it doesn't end there. So, you know, typically when the tree is done, it was recycled into mulch for, you know, walking trails in upstate New York or upstate Manhattan. Um, the 2007, the first year that they used LED lights, is also the first year that the tree was donated to Habitat for Humanity after the, uh, like, after it serves its purpose. So, so now when trees go to Rockefeller Center, they're, 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 they're kind of lumbered or broken down and they are using Habitat for Humanity houses to build houses for people, which I think is the coolest thing. That's really cool. I know, right? So this year's tree, let's, let's get down to the thing that really matters. This year's tree is from Vestal, New York. Or Vestal, I don't, I don't know. So apologies to people if I pronounced your town name incorrectly. Um, and it is an 80-year-old Norway it. spruce and is 80 feet tall and 43 feet wide. Also, for those of us who are not familiar with New York, New Jersey, uh, Vestal is kind of on that border of New York and Pennsylvania. It's a little south of Syracuse, so it's like the, like the this part of New York. It's really far upstate. Yeah. It's like not, I mean, it's not as far upstate as like, you know, basically Canada, but it's closer to Canada than it is to New York City, which is great. Um, So the real question is, how do they source this tree? So there's one guy that pretty much is like the tree decider. So people can send in their tree from all over the country. They can, um, there's also the company that they've been working with for a very long time. They kind of have an eye out for like different areas or different trees that they could potentially want to work with or potentially want to use. So Eric Paws is the head gardener for Rockefeller Center and he is the end all be all authority on all things Rockefeller Center tree. So he chooses the tree each year, I think, and it's kept very secret until they announce like what the tree will be that year. So I think right now he already has like the next two to three years of trees picked. That's just nobody knows who they are. Oh, they they pick it years in advance and they just wait as it like. Yeah. Well, oh, that's so I, I didn't I did not know that. So once a tree is picked. Um, usually two to three years. I think it's usually around two in advance. Um, they, he or someone on his team will go up there and start, you know, caring for the tree, fertilizing it, um, maybe making monthly things just, just to check up on the tree because, you know, it's it's been chosen. So it is the chosen one. Uh, That's so cool. But yeah, so his team is very hands-on. And then when it comes to actually getting the tree, a lot of times they will, um, a lot of times it'll get donated, but the Rockefeller Center um, they usually end up paying the people who donate it for um, like their trouble. Um, and uh, other people, you know, they don't necessarily want to part with the tree, but, you know, money makes money makes people do some good things. Um, so the um, so pause. Now you just made me sad. I mean, it's OK. Some people loved it. One person was like, oh, this tree cut down and now I finally have sunlight in my bathroom and I no longer have mold. Other people are like, oh, this tree has been on our family land for forever. And it's just kind of all different sides of the all, all different sides of the spectrum. But it's still really cool. Somebody mentioned that we should cut down the the big tree in front of my lawn <laughs> recently. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I will cry. I mean, I just had a bunch of trees cut down at my house, but they were also super dead. So it was one of those where yeah, I was like, yeah. I don't really want this to fall on my house. Yeah, I know. I know. There's reasons. Okay. So when Eric Paws goes out to look for these trees, when he's out there scouring the town, which can you imagine just like slow rolling down a driveway and people will be like, what are you looking for? Like, no, I'm just here to look at your trees. Oh, he, he scouts? Yes. So instead of not everyone submits their own, he'll go around mm-hmm. looking. So he'll get some that are submitted and then, but ultimately like he'll just drive around and kind of see what there is to see you know that's crazy and i wonder i want to know what what constitutes a good 
tree for him you know what's his on what's on his list real i'm so happy that you asked because <laughs> like any good supply chain manager he has a list of things that he's looking for for quality assurance so okay it has to be at least 70 feet tall at least okay which i feel like is asking a lot but what do i know um and it has to be 40 feet in diameter and he wants it to be ex- – he pretty much exclusively looks for Norway spruces because um, their size and it's a, their, their ability, like the branches, to hold the weight of the lights and the decorations for the tree. Good to know. Norway spruce. Yeah. Okay. So. That's going to be on my list this year. Yes. And if you have a Norway spruce that you think is perfect for the tree, um, you can submit it on Rockefeller Center's website, which is where a lot of this information came from. <laughs> so – uh, so traditionally, these trees are sourced from within a few hours of New York City, as we saw this year. Um, there one back, the one that was found in Ohio in 1998, that is definitely an outlier and very atypical. So you might be asking, how do you get the tree to Manhattan? Great question. I'd love to tell you. Um, the same company has been working on taking down these trees and delivering it to the Rockefeller Center for a about the basically since 1981 that's the earliest report i could find of this company um torsorelli inc apologies if i am completely butchering the name um they have they are like the guys they are the people that come in and do it um they are a landscaping company out of gladstone new jersey which for those not familiar with new jersey it's about 40 minutes from newark so you know it's it's close ish to the city ish ish correct there you go see i thought you would be proud of my new jersey <laughs> very proud <laughs> okay so these guys have continuously basically they are the guys because they don't delegate they do it themselves and um it's just they think of it as a public service a public event and um they're just super loyal to it and that was uh, a quote from the management company of rockefeller center from a 1996 new york times article so like these guys have been doing it for a while and doing it very well Mm -hmm. and just think about that claim to fame though you're like where are the company that transports the the rockefeller center tree like that's a really cool right and i have personally looked all over their website and they don't have it listed anywhere so like it's not it's like they have some pictures so they don't boast their art installations and it just happens to feature the tree but i'm like i would be putting that all over the place I'm actually really surprised because I, I assumed that like their whole branding would be like, we transport the tree. <laughs> well, they actually help. There are some of the people that help scout locations for the tree. So like if they're out and about, they see them and send it over to Eric. That's for, crazy. Um, stuff like that. So Eric, you're on a first name basis with him. Yes, uh, they probably are. And so one of the cool things, so I, you know how I said that the tree is usually donated and some people are compensated. Um, the, one of the things that you get when you, when your tree is selected is the Torsarellis will, do, will do landscaping for you. Like they give you free landscaping mostly because they destroy your lawn when they take the tree. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. Cause they have to have a crane to like lift it up. And so like they're gone, tear up your yard, but it's very nice that they're like, we'll fix it and put it back and get you kind of whatever you want. Also, what does that stump look like? That they're, I would they hope, would clearly have to take out. I would hope out. they grind it out because, uh, I, well, if they're doing all that landscaping, wouldn't that include the grinding out of the stuff? I would hope so because I, I would want to keep it. <laughs> Put a little like make it a tree. stage. I mean, it's like a whole 40, 40 feet in diameter. Is that what you said? I think so. So this is like these trees are not near anyone's house. These, these are like in the woods. Like yeah. yeah. Well, I think the branches have to be 40 feet. The The actual trunk is not 40 feet in diameter. I knew that. <laughs> like, I, I understood. That was bad. Okay, oh so my God. we've got the tree selected. The Torsarellis have cut it out of the ground. And what happens next? Well, uh, the Torsarellis have actually made a custom-built trailer that's a low boy flatbed that is designed to be 100 feet long to accommodate this tree. So they kind of wrap the tree up and have like ways to kind of make it skinny. Um, so that way they can stick it on a trailer and ship it down to Manhattan. Um, because as you know, uh, Manhattan streets are very uh, unforgiving. Uh, and if your tree is too wide, that buildings don't care. 
building down there. So they don't put it through one of those like funnel shoots that you you get at the that that like them put the net around it now yeah not a shoot nope, big no enough net. That. Uh, they <laughs> just kind of tie it down it's actually really cool on the rockefeller center uh what our instagram they have pictures of it all like bundled up and then they put a tarp on it that says like christmas incoming rockefeller center tree and then the year and so it's really cool how they do it um but so basically it gets put on this really long trailer and then um it goes they drive it down the highway sometimes there's people that will stand out wave to it it's a whole thing it's really cute um and then um but once they get into downtown manhattan they'll usually park kind of outside of the city and then around 3 a.m with the help of the new york police department they will drive they will close streets and drive that tree into into the city because it's three o'clock and you know manhattan is always a mess um so it gets there and then it gets hoisted up via a crane and then the scaffolding gets built and people decorate it so it's really cool and then the one year that they flew it in from ohio the torcerellis went out to ohio locked like took like kind of bandaged it all up put it on a plane um that was the world's largest cargo plane a russian Antonov AN-124 with 124 foot long cargo hold and it was flown to JFK where then it was transported like normal to Manhattan and that's how the tree gets there every year. That's crazy. Imagine being on that flight like there's a giant tree in this plane. (laughs) Well I mean like you have to always almost wonder like when you're picking up the dimensions of the tree and of the um, because I think that was the year that it was the 100 foot tree um, and wow. Yeah, and so you, we're gonna use a hundred foot tree, and we're gonna oh, no, bring it, it as far away from possible. It wasn't oh. the, the next year was the hundred foot tree, but still, okay. it's like eighty feet, and you have a hundred twenty four feet of cargo space. Like that's mm-hmm. a. I really hope you measured correctly. <laughs> right, there's a calculation off, and they they're getting it in, but then it gets wider, and they can't. Yes. It's stuck. That's where it's <laughs> like we're just gonna have to hope it fits because we don't have any other option. <laughs> just hold it tight. And just like go slow, exactly. <laughs> like have bungee cords and have someone sitting in the back, like strapped to the airplane, just holding the rope. Uh, like this is fine. We understand that that's not possible, and these are jokes. Yes, these. Just so everyone yes, because you would. Yeah, no planes. It's just kind just of when, because I thought it's kind of when you like you know try to get it home from the tree place uh, yourself. That that's what I was imagining, but in a giant cargo plane. I personally would like to think that they did that that way. But that is all I have for getting the tree to Rockefeller Center. Um, and it's really cool. And I mean, I think that uh, anyone who has the opportunity to go see it should see it. OK, so I don't want to get into this because this is that's what the trucks thing. Okay. But I'm going to quickly ask you, I'm assuming you have a fake tree because it's already. Up. Yes. OK, I'm real all the way. So Just I have super bad allergies. We got this whole oh, thing yeah. on Twitter the other day. So I have super bad allergies and I'm allergic to cinnamon. So I am all fake all the time because I am that girl that like when it's fall and people open their windows or it's spring and people open their windows. That's not me because I like right. breathing. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have any like allergies or anything like that. So we're, we're just all for the real tree. It's so much fun. I, I mean, it's also a pain. Want, <laughs> I but... want to want I want to have a real tree. I want to be cool enough for that. But like it turns out I really like breathing. Yeah. That's true. Surviving is kind of cool. <laughs> okay, so Brielle, do you have any fun facts about the Rockefeller Center tree? Perhaps some show and tell for us? Um, I have one fun fact, and it's actually a Brielle fun fact. It's about my life. Perfect. Those um, are my favorite. We're going to pause south. It seems as though show and tell is canceled because I no longer have the item. I thought I had it in this drawer right here because for years it's literally been next to me. But I get these bouts of like, I need to throw everything out. So I probably threw it out by accident, which is really terrible when you hear what my show and tell was going to be. So when I was in college, I was often I my high school friends went to school in the city. So we would often visit them and we would go to the bars. And one day it was after Christmas time and we were at the bars and it closed and we were like still wanted to do something. And we were like, let's do something weird or, you know, random. And we decided to go look at the tree at three o'clock in the morning. 
And so we went down to Rockefeller Center and actually up. We were probably far downtown. But anyway, uh, and we got there and it just so happened to be the night that they were cutting up the tree. So they were taking it down and we got we got to see all the wood chippers. I mean, it was this crazy production at three o'clock in the morning in an empty city. Like It was cr- it was one of the craziest things I'd ever witnessed. And the guys let us take a light bulb and uh, a, a tree branch. So I had a tree branch. Obviously, that didn't last for a long time. But then I had a little light bulb. And it's yeah, I would say it's like this is an accurate size. Like it was about this big. I'm really upset. <laughs> I'm sure, but yeah. I'm sure you probably moved it somewhere super safe because we were just talking about this not too long ago and you're like, I didn't like, I'm not going to throw this away. So I feel like you probably put it somewhere very safe the same way that I put things somewhere very safe and then can't find them for two years. Possibly they could be in. I think I know where it is. Okay. And this. Oh, okay. Never mind. That sucks. It's gone. Gone forever. Well, that's all I have for you today, Brielle. This, uh, that's that's my story for you. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, uh, thank you guys for joining us today. And that was the Rockefeller Tree. Uh, don't forget to tune in back again in two weeks from now. Uh, Thursdays at 1 p.m. on anywhere you get your podcasts and Freight Waves TV on YouTube. Um, thank you, Mary, for telling us that story. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jekyll Brielle, or you can email me at bjekyll at freightways.com. And Mary, what about you? Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, a little bit of Wikipedia because it helps me find things. Um, but find sources. She found the sources through Wikipedia. That was literally what it was, though, um, because that's how I found um the Rockefeller Center website, which had a great bunch of resources, the New York Times historical, like a archives article, um, and even a random thing from Cleveland, Ohio, that talked about the the flight. So, um, big big shout out to those sources. Um, and then, other than that, you can find me on Twitter at Mario underscore one one nine. And if you have any really cool Rockefeller Center uh, tree stories, uh, feel free to shoot them to us because I'd love to hear them. Thanks, everyone. Oh, wait, no, South is still recording. <laughs> okay, good. We just add it in at the end. Just add this part at the very end. P.S. I found it. Yay.